Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Open Source and Business, a series of conversations why, where we explore all of the ways that open source affects uh, the business world, from business models all the way to how, how companies develop and, and, and deploy software. And uh, today, I'm joined by uh, Stephen Wally of Microsoft and Jeff Borek of IBM. Um, the dynamic duo. They have a long history of discussing and debating uh, whether open source is actually a business model or not. And so today we're going to explore this idea of what is a business model, how does open source fit into a business model, and I really hope we can get into some of the some of the nuance around around how open source can affect um, how you approach doing business in a in a in a in a broad and general manner. Uh, so, Stephen, you kind of started us on this by writing a blog post a few years ago called Open Source is Not a Business Model. And um, repeating that, like uh, having an encore performance just a few years later with Open Source is Not a Business Model, Redux. Uh, so I wonder if you can uh, get us started by explaining, you know, where did that come from? Why is Open Source not a business model? Well, and I want to just jump in and give my colleague safe harbor because both I'm sure Stephen as well as myself are gonna express our learned opinions, not necessarily those of our employer, but. Absolutely, yes, a safe yeah. harbor statement, always, always useful. And um, we'll 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 uh, say, um, uh, you know, comments are welcome. The, the comment forum on the right is intended to be a dynamic conversational format. And if you have questions, I will ask them as well in the chat. Just feel free to drop them in the chat or in the Q&A tool. Stephen, yes. take us away. Th thank you for that, Jeff. It, it, Jeff and I are used to doing this on stage. So it, it's we're used to you know slides and a to and fro kind of format here. But I think this, this format actually lends itself better to the, the real discussion. Uh, the, the blog posts that Dave is uh, referring to, they, they started from that perspective of, look, it's not a business model, folks. It's an engineering model kind of thing. And, and there was that that great quote from Paul Cormier, the president of Red Hat, that you know, Red Hat is not an open source company, that it's an enterprise software company that happens to understand open source engineering. And that was very much the, the richness of that discussion uh, in that first blog post. And it's where I, I, I retell the story from early in my career around open source where you know I have hard data on just how much engineering value we captured in the GCC compiler in a particular situation that I was involved in back in the 90s. And so you know, I, I argued it from that. But every time I did this, when we did this on stage, Jeff and I together, you know, Jeff would then present his side and you know, the vote at the end, I'd lose. I'd, I'd <laughs> lose every time. So apparently I can't argue it from, look, it's an engineering model. It's the way you build products. And there's this idea that you know projects and products are separate, and so the the last time we tried this, I, I we were in Lyon uh, at a Linux Foundation event, and and I tried changing it up uh, instead of trying to argue that it's it's not a business model from an engineering perspective. I actually tried to tackle it from the business model perspective and the idea that if you're if you're a, a software company, you have to run a software business. How you choose to do that business, you know, there's a, a there's a, a rich variety of ways that you can license the software and, and build a customer's perception of the value. But at the end of the day, you're running a business. And so you have to run the business. And that there's a real challenge, if you will, to parking an OSI approved license on your core value proposition to your customers that you better explain, be able to explain that really crisply because that's a business model design challenge. And that if you further park your identity brand on an open source project and not your actual product solution to customers, then, then you've almost you know, doubly tied your hands behind your back as you're starting your business. And so that the, these are, let's, let's argue it from a business model uh, perspective and and I I dragged you know Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm into it and Clayton Christensen's innovators dilemma, so it was and that was the one time of all the times Jeff and I have done this that I actually inched over the line a little ahead of him in these discussions. So that's where I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick on this that it's you know 
it's not a business model. It's an engineering thing. And you have to run a company for the business of itself. I like I like the distinction you make about talking. That's where about, I'm standing. Yeah, open source is a, um, you know, a software business has a business model design. It's something we don't think about very often. I think is is how you design a business model around what you're selling. Uh, Jeff, can you can you maybe elaborate on, uh, like you've you've always taken the counter position that actually open source is a business model. Uh, so I'm not going to hold you to hold your feet to the fire on that, but can you no, explain? hold how... my feet. Hold my feet. <laughs> well, how how does like how does open source as a foundational element of a business like dramatically affect the business model? In what ways does it affect it uh, from your perspective? Like, why would you say that open source is a business model? Well, it's you know I, the reason I've done this debate with Stephen is that I really did truly appreciate the engineering eth ethos in which Stephen applied that first blog and then the second blog. And, you know, I'd seen uh, Stephen give this talk, you know, way back when we were first getting to know each other. And I thought, wow, this, this could be fun to do as sort of a debate. And so principally from an engineering perspective, you know, there's a lot that Stephen says I agree about, but I also think that collaboratively developed, liberally licensed software is about evolving business models. And to take a hard position that there is no open source business model is to ignore a lot of interesting signposts along the way. And part of the you know chat, uh, I actually referenced this idea that you know when when was the first um, commercially uh, collaboratively developed, liberally licensed open source enterprise operating system released. That's a lot of qualifiers there, Jeff. Well, yeah, but I mean, so people automatically they're, think about they're good Linux, qualifiers. and they think about Red Hat and SUSE and who could have it been, uh, but it actually happened way back um, uh, in 1959 when I was a toddler and Cher released their uh, first uh, collaboratively developed version of an operating system for the IBM 709 uh, mainframe. So open source has been around for, you know, e over 20 years, but it even goes, its roots go back even farther. And the idea of finding a way to, you know, uh, leverage this uh, model of software development into a business model is something that people have been doing for, you know, every bit of, uh, along the way. Exactly. Yeah, there, there is that idea that, you know, we, we've we've collaborated on software since we wrote software. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it, it, even I've got stories that go even earlier than Jeff, all the way back to some of the very first work done on programmable computers in America at Princeton. And there was a clear sign of as these early programmers figured out things, they were sharing it across the different research projects that they were you know, swapping time on this monster machine in a basement at Princeton on. So it's, we've shared software forever mm -hmm. kind of thing. But when you, when right, you draw copyright law you know, on, on top of it and you suddenly say, oh, computer software is protected by copyright law in 1980, that created this proliferation of licensing experiments and that's what we now call open source software is the licensing experiments. But the, the, the engineering economics of collaborating is, is always apparent and you know, all the way back through comfortably through the fifties. So I mean, it, it's the, the idea of software being separate from the hardware it's running on is really something that only started in the seventies, right? It, it's until then you, when you got hardware, you got the software with it, and it was kind of really yeah. It, it was so funny how you know inverted the industry was back then, right? Because it was all about the hardware, and that's another thing I would touch on in our early debates was that, you know, uh, IBM famously, you know, was uh, under scrutiny in the early '80s to be broken up by the you know Federal Trade Commission because ooh, IBM sold a big bad mainframe, and it was one big fat price and under the covers, you know, you got the software and some implementation services kind of as part of the deal. And IBM finally, you know, relented and decided to, you know, unbundle its software back in 69. 
And it actually was a little bit of a windfall in some respects for IBM because suddenly, wow, we can charge for ZOS. What should we charge? Well, what yeah. will the market bear? Right. And, and that, you yeah, see, secretly, I blame IBM for copyright landing on <laughs> software. Yeah, you know, they, they'd already, they'd been through the <laughs> Department of Justice meat grinder once before they were threatened with it again. And they thought, let's carve off this thing and we'll tell them that they could go charge money for it. Software is, has, owes a lot to the open letter to hobbyists. So, you know, if we're talking about origin stories. Yes, I, I was just about to touch on that, Dave, because, <laughs> you know, Bill Gates wrote that letter back in 76. So I, I think there are all sorts of fingerprints on the issue of copyright and software. And how are we going to make a living out of this if you guys keep passing this stuff away for free? If you're stealing my stuff. Yes. Yeah. And we didn't have copyright in those days, so they really were stealing his stuff. <laughs> but you both touched on uh, something I find interesting and, and kind of nuanced, and I want to dig into a little bit. Is, is Stephen, you've talked about business model design, and, and, and Jeff, you've talked about how open source enables business models. Um, can we talk about, you know, what? how would you define what a business model is? I mean, I have a very simplistic view of this as like, your business model is you identify what you're going to sell, how much you're going to sell it for, and how much it costs you produ to produce it. And if if the former figure is bigger than the second, the, than the latter figure, you've got a business model. But I mean, that's obviously overly simpl simplistic. But like, how would the two of you describe what a business model is? Dave, there's a reason you work in the part of Red Hat you do, because <laughs> they don't depend on you to generate revenue. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I was I was gonna tease them differently. I, there's there's actually like the simplicity of it is what you just described, you know, spend less than you earn. Um, I One of the startups I, I, I had the pleasure of working in, uh, it was a services business. And this was the third uh, services business that the CEO had basically taken from very small through massive growth and then uh, gone public and or sold kind of thing. And it was, it was this idea that it was a machine. For them, um, zero to a thousand employees with a hundred million run rate in four years was the model. You know, anything under a hundred employees was a boutique business. But if you actually said, so, so, so Bob, you know, what's the secret to you, the way you do this? Because he, they'd done it twice already successfully. And and Bob would get kind of quiet and he'd go, well, you know, you, you hire good people and you treat them well and you, you solve your customers' problems. And that was it. Like, that was his entire advice. Now, I, I got to see it up close where the, the tinkering that he did to drive that kind of growth engine. And re remember, we're talking a services business, so it's all scaling on people. So how do you scale people? And, and you know, software companies will tell you they hate the margins on the consulting services business. But he basically had a controller who did more work than any CFO I've ever seen in a startup. And the, the person who ran recruiting and HR, you know, HR was kind of the side function. It was really about recruiting. And then there was this, this magical human being who ran delivery, who sat there balancing between these folks as to, do we have enough staff to do the job without burning out the staff? So that you could, and, and the three of them would have a real time discussion. Every time the VP of sales came in and said, I have this hot new lead, can we start with you know five people in a month? And it was, it was driven though around all that, for, Despite all of that process and, and the magic of it, it was still basically hire good people, treat them well, because that way they'll treat your customers well, and go do the go do the thing that you're solving. And I think a lot of it comes down to what problem are you solving for your customer. Um, I I've always described the pivot that Red Hat made in about 2002 as they realized that they weren't in the Linux distro business anymore. That up until that point, uh, Bob Young and then Matt Zulik had run a business that was all about being the best Linux distro. 
and they just did the better packaging of everything and the better testing in small small pieces and and they'd grown the business over 10 years to get there but somewhere around 2002 at that explosion of the web where companies were now rapidly scaling this stuff out somebody inside a red hat seemed to have figured out that it's not about being the best linux distro we're cheap unix on intel at a time when they were racking out servers and they they pivoted that business pitch and went and solved that problem for the customer and all you know this was this seemed to be cheap unix and and apparently you know and and on the red hat business model side it's like and we don't have to write a check to at&t anymore and and so that that was that's that was the business model but it was still coming down to what was the problem they were solving for their customer now there's no, that old this also brings up a great point because it's like who pays dave your 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 point earlier who pays for free software okay. who in their right mind pays for free software and you know you typically hear oh big companies do or oh no the financial services sector does or uh, you know companies that lack skills to you know sort of self implement and those are all wrong answers from my perspective People that pay for software pay for it because they've developed mission critical apps that run on it. Right. And that's that's really another big part of you know Red Hat and Mongo and Suze's business model is subscription support because when it cacks in the middle of the night, which software occasionally will do, um, you Surprisingly. want someone Surprising. to call. <laughs> And it's not even that. It's it's we know that software is is a verb, not a noun, right? It's it's something that that you operate. It's something that evolves over time. You have security issues that turn up. You have you know new updates that need to be done. Things evolve in both in your requirements and in terms of what the software is is running on top of, right? That uh, so as software is required to evolve, um, it's kind of nice to have somebody who helps that evolution. Stephen also does a very interesting thread on, you know, you want freeloaders, you know, you, you want, you know, the yeah. folks that are never going to pay for your software because, you know, that's just part of the cost of doing business. And the, the interesting question is how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? Yeah. If you've got, you know, a thousand people using your code and only one of them, you know, one in a thousand is your conversion rate, you know, how do you find out who that you know demographic is, and how do you make sure you're selling to that portion of the large? It, it's it's Miko C. Law. I'm going to intercept that layup there, Stephen, and we're no, gonna... no, I want to, I want to. Well, we're we're going to talk about conversion rates and how you think of your customers versus your community, and, and conversion and... rates are a myth. <laughs> It's, it, I, I do want to get to that topic, but a little bit later, I still, I, I want to stick on, on like. A lot of the things we've talked about, Jeff, up until now, um, the open sourceness of the software does not affect at all. Uh, so how how would you say a business model is profoundly affected by the by the fact that you're doing open source? Like, in what well, way does the open source enter into that business 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 model conversation? Let me answer that question with a question. <clears throat> would you say that? You could have a, you know, you talked about selling something and making sure that you sold it for more than it costs, and therefore that's your business model. Would you say that you could say you had a direct, you know, if, if you sold, you know, straight to your customers, not through any sort of intermediary, would you say that you have a, uh, a direct selling business model? Would that be a fair statement? Sure. So I have to think about it. I, I, mean, argument I, I, is, I, I know your argument. Job. I just haven't figured Steven's out. Stephen's argument in the past has been that you know, and I've heard others say this too. Open source is not a business model; it's a distribution, you know, channel. And it's they're, kind they're of like that thing. I, it's it's like the line I teased you with Dave on Twitter. It's basically is are, are we getting chocolate in our peanut butter, or are we getting you know water in our oil in the engine, which is the last thing you want to do, right? I mean, to me. Um, a open source business model <clears throat> uh, is a state is a statement that a startup can claim. And in fact, you can actually go out and Google 
uh, open source yeah. business model Wikipedia, and there's a nice big fat page describing a whole list of different business models that you try to apply to it. Which right? is, I think, my point. The point I would make is that there are many business models that work with open source. The open sourceness is an influencing factor, but it's not like the business model itself is not open source. Uh, it's if a key you... I would say it's a key factor, right? Because why, why do, why do we have, you know, it's just like, right. You know, obviously when Steve and I started this, it was interesting as well, because this idea of license tweaking, and, and maybe you want to get to that in a little bit later, but this idea was relatively new, you know, seven, six years ago. And it's, it's not gone away. It's only continued to proliferate. And most recently, we've seen players like, you know, Datastax, you know, take a pretty aggressive position of saying, you know, this is the way we're going to do things. And, um, you know, I, I'm not arguing that they're right or wrong. And I, I'm also, it's also another interesting point to reflect on the dynamic here, right? Because some people say, oh, you know, open source was doing just fine until the era of cloud came around. And cloud is now consuming open source the way open source consumed enterprise software. And, you know, is that a good thing? Is that fair? And um, uh, I, I don't view it as a David and Goliath thing per se. I do think that it isn't pleasant when you see some of the hyperscale players who have consumed the ever loving heck out of open source to be able to scale out their platforms. And we're largely absent when it came to contributing back until perhaps relatively recently. Um, and so, you know, that in some people's minds, this creates this David versus Goliath. Oh, the poor little startup is being, you know, uh, what is that strip mining uh, on the part of a hyperscaler? Um, I, I follow the, the, um, the old Watergate quote of, you know, uh, follow the money. Follow the money. And it's really a fight between, you know, the successful hyperscalers, uh, some of them anyway, and the um, VC community, right, that's throwing gobs of money at these open source startups. And, you know, I mean, to me, that's another no brainer to say that, yes, there's an open source business model. Mongo has one. You know, um, Elastic has one, you know, Mongo is now a $9 billion valued corporation and, you know, Elastic's not too far behind at 6 billion. No, so. no, the, the Elastic's ahead now. So, oh, are, have they passed? Yeah. But I, I think going back to something you said, Dave, is, is important. Like we, we keep, we keep forgetting the customer in this discussion. If you have a business model, you must have a customer across from you because they're the person giving you the money to solve some problem for them. And, and I think the, the, the thing we've seen now is you'll see customers want open source. And the cleanest example we probably have in, in kind of the last 10 years is, is Kubernetes. I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta have to buy Kubernetes because Kubernetes is open source and that means I have a choice. And now we're, we're, we're falling back to, you know, Linux apparently gave you a choice. And it never gave you a choice, just like buying Unix and open systems in the 90s gave you a choice. And no, that wasn't really true either. The switching costs are, are just enormous. But it's not that that's, oh, that's the secret business case behind it. That, you know, we have switching costs. But the customer does want to reduce their dependence on single vendors. So they buy, they buy things that are open. In, in reasonable appearance. So it was, you know, open systems was the message in the 90s, open standards was the message in the noughties, and now for the last decade, it's been open source. And that, despite the fact that, you know, Red, Red Hat embeds Kubernetes in OpenShift, Microsoft sells AKS, you've got, you know, GKE from Google and EKS from, from Amazon. And it's like, those are four products that are built out of the Kubernetes project. Kubernetes is a project. Kubernetes is open source licensed. And you know, these four companies have rich product spaces pulling that those components into their product space and plumbing a whole lot of you know proprietary terrible things into it. And, and the, the terrible things that we plumb into it, the Kubernetes project, well, it's our billing system and it's the port, we plumb it into the portal 
and we had a whole lot of proprietary drivers for the hardware that's that sits in the fleet for you know storage and networking and things and it's but the customer well, buys this this concept of open uh, but i take exception to your statement just a moment ago stephen open source doesn't give you a choice open source I'm kind of with you on this <laughs> does not give you a choice and here's a great example of that so back in the 2012s when clearly amazon was gaining traction and microsoft was starting to you know gather their forces and uh, aggressively uh, go after the public cloud market um, google was also there and google was going to their major customers and saying knock 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 hey you know we see that you know mr or ms cio it's good to see you today we'd like you to we see you're consuming AWS and we'd like you to try GPC. You know, we think we have a better mousetrap. And uh, clearly Google's always had a pretty strong reputation as being a technically sophisticated organization. And, but more often than not, the conversation went along the lines of, well, yes, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I, I am using AWS. I told IBM six months ago, I wasn't swore I'd never would. And uh, yet it came through the side door and I find now that some of my engineers have developed some applications that are running on AWS. And gosh, I'm a little nervous about it because it's kind of like the Roach Motel. I can put my applications in, but goodness, how am I ever going to get them out again? So Google, you know, you're even though you've got this um, infrastructure that runs on the Borg, which is what the um, container orchestration uh, software that runs Google's global ad platform is called. They basically said it looks every bit as proprietary as, you know, my relationship with AWS, so pass. And Google, after hearing that multiple times and being the smart folks they are, they said, hmm, we, we need to provide an alternative. Let's create a project to create an enterprise-friendly version of the Borg, and we'll put that out as an on-ramp to our GPC and it'll be open source. So therefore the customers will come flocking. And after they got their project up and running and they got it to the point where they were thinking that it was ready for prime time, they went back to the same CIOs and said, hey, we heard you, we took your feedback. Now we've got this Kubernetes thing. And so how about giving us a try? And by and large, they got a lot of respect, but the majority of those same audiences said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's great that you put it out in open source Google, but, you know, it still looks proprietary to us. Well, why is that? Well, it's a community of one. Yeah. And when you have a community of one, in effect, it's not a level playing field. It's not a, you know, diverse, rich ecosystem. And, and fortunately, you know, IBM and you know, Red Hat and others came knocking at Google's door saying, hey, we like your project. We'd love to collaborate with you on Kubernetes, but, you know, we're not going to do it until it's out in open governance. And, you know, Google did the right thing and put it out and, you know, it became a ro roaring success. I mean, the CNCF is now a bigger project uh, built around Kubernetes than even Linux is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was... No, knowing some of the backstory in there as well, there, there's some intentionality in there that was just brilliant along with the execution that helped kind of kick it over each each of the next steps into its growth phase. The But that's, that's the thing, is the customers buying an option on openness. They're not buying open source. Like when they, when they, when they write a big check to, to Red Hat, because RHEL is this phenomenal enterprise software mm -hmm. packaging of a Unix-like operating system, you know, they're not buying Linux. They're buying the promise of Linux. They're buying the fact that Linux looks a lot like the Unix they were buying. Um, you know, it's it's those are the kinds of things that it's it's this belief system that goes with it. And you know, the the projects are not the products that people buy. So I think we all agree on that. The argument for uh, Kubernetes. Is, a, is very similar to the argument for POSIX. 
It's you could write your. I want to point out. I did not write. I did not use that word first in this discussion. <laughs> I just need to point that out. You, you could write your applications to a standard API. To, so Kubernetes, you've got standard storage Man, network. Twinkle and in Stevens' eye popped through the camera just the moment you said POSIX too. I and it and a good uh, thing and to see. Provided a common programming API to the underlying operating system. But it created an illusion of portability because I worked for a software vendor in the 90s, and we did use, for the most part, POSIX APIs. And you know, different Unices implemented things slightly differently, and we had porting issues on every single SVR for Linux. Are well, you? That's an, it's another interesting dynamic of the ecosystem and how business models around the open source ecosystem compete because right. Red Hat, being the market leader, as Stephen pointed out earlier, um, had little incentive to collaborate with the other Linux distribution providers because yeah, no, it, you know that was, who that wants was to, historically who wants to support, fun to watch. Who, who wants to support interoperability and portability if you're the market leader? Hmm. After a point, but but up until 1999, 2000, you know, all of the Linux distributions were essentially competing for one thing, which was users, right? I, I mean, Red Hat Linux was free, SUSE was free. The main differentiation was, you know, default settings on the desktops and which window manager you used. It wasn't, right. and the package manager, I guess. Yeah. But but Dave, there, there was there was that transitional period where people, development shops had gotten used to the Unix programming API through the 90s. And this was now the new way, you know, it was very carefully brought into the Linux world through the 90s. And, you know, I, I joked when, when I was trying, when I was trying to build Unix on, on Windows NT back in the end of the 90s, I, I joked that, you know, Wally's first law of application portability was every useful application outlives the platform on which it was originally developed and deployed. And that, you know, I, it was kind of a glib throwaway line in a talk that I gave back then. But it, it's true. We keep ending up in these situations where as technology phases kind of come through every decade or so, and they're, they're kind of seismic changes every 20 years, but there's still big changes every decade. You know, form factors keep shrinking. The cost of the form factors keep shrinking. And you end up in this space where you think, well, we have to get that mission critical business critical application now to the new thing however it gets packaged and moved and you end up in this space again where okay so how do we express a POSIX operating system interface in the cloud like how how do we how do we enable this application that we wrote that we wrote and how do we carry it through but i i, I think going going back to an earlier point there's also this concept of risk that every you know, all of a sudden you have CIOs and all, all the people in that department looking at it from that, that risk management perspective of, we have what's been working and we have to move to this thing that we don't know. And how do they do the risk management? There was, it, it was around 2006, I was talking to a CIO who at the time was happily writing a check to Red Hat for JBoss support because that was critical. They'd met a, made a bet on JBoss as their Java application server. And then he got kind of sheepish because he wasn't buying RHEL support yet. The few hundred machines they had that they racked out Red Hat Linux on was Red Hat Linux from a DVD in the back of a book. And they weren't really keeping with the updates and that, but that, that gave them the simple enough running model, but they really, really, really cared about that their, their application server. That was the big risk thing in their head. But they also realized that yeah, they were going to have to start writing that check for RHEL support as well. That this was the just part of the transition in the business risk management space as they continued to evolve their application suite, kind of generation on generation on generation across these server farms. So, so speaking so to of reset, evolving a business reset, model, Stephen, I, I have a question for you. If I yes, could, please. Uh, you know, you you mentioned. It's a trap. Oh, sorry. You mentioned Paul Cormier's uh, quote about that they are an enterprise software company, not not an open source company per se. Yep. Is is Microsoft an enterprise software company today, or how is Microsoft evolving? We better be. 
<laughs> in the era of Azure. That's where I go to work. Yeah, I mean, Azure is is, is enterprise software. But then so was Windows Server through, through that growth period of the noughties along with, and, and when you look at it, even the no, office. My, my case, point, Stephen, is that I'd say you guys are moving to um, enterprise software as a service. Is, is the service aspect of that critical in that in that definition that and and uh, the way the reason i'm asking there was a, a an internal piece of education the first time i worked at microsoft so we're going back you know 16 years kind of thing there was a discussion around this new subscription model idea and everybody was very excited on the business side inside of Microsoft, inside of the Windows division, that we were gonna figure out how to do a subscription model. And I don't remember the company that it kind of was demonstrating back in the, the early 2000s that subscriptions was kind of an interesting way to sell software. And there was lots and lots of excitement about that. And then the person responsible for all the OEM licensing for Microsoft got up and took the stage and said, you know, we've heard many interesting things about subscriptions and how exciting that world's going to be. Let me tell you how we make money. And he walked us through the OEM business. And, and it was startling. And that was kind of that first time that I'd really seen, okay, so we're talking about Windows. We're just talking about Windows. Does it really matter how you slice up that pricing? Are, are, is it a subscription or is it a license fee? Does that matter? You know, is, what are you actually selling? Pe people laughed that Red Hat couldn't make money on a support model. But at the end of the day, what was what was Microsoft and Windows? That was a, that was a support model. You bought the thing, it was on your machine, and they sent you updates. That That's support. You know, you yeah, had a number that you there's could an interesting There's an interesting thread to that too, though, Stephen, in that, you know, what ultimately helped Red Hat become successful was that they trademarked their brand. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the ability to, you know, enforce a, a business model through through the trademark was a key part of, you know, a, a pivot that they did and different, you know, bifurcating Fedora and, you know, REL uh, was, you know, a, a key um, pivot point in the evolution of Red Hat's gym. Very much so. I, I think that's the challenge for a lot of these new startups over this last decade is, in rushing to do some, what they believe is an open source business model, they park their identity brand on the project instead of the, the product that solves the customer problem. And if they're lucky, they see it in time and start to unpick that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, Elasticsearch seems to have done a reasonable job of shortening the, you know, the company name became Elastic. Uh, Docker rebranded the open source projects to Moby. Uh, you know, it, it's Mongo. Mongo managed to somehow escape the, the trap before it was too late, and managed to manage to go public. But I, I'm sure it caused their their sales teams a certain amount of angst and confusion when they were trying to explain the difference between the no, no, you, the customer, are giving us money to solve this problem for you. We happen to be using <laughs> this this project over here to build our product that has the same name. So to, please don't be confused. Uh, I, I'm sure that was difficult. It has been something of a theme in this series of like the, the importance of trademark and of, of having an identity that's a kind of a source for your product. But Red Hat went through that same pain. We've already talked about Red Hat Linux being the free operating system and that migration from Red Hat Linux to the bifurcation enterprise Linux on one side and Fedora on the other was was a painful transition, right? It, it didn't happen overnight. And, uh, you know, not everybody was happy with that uh, for, uh, for obvious reasons. So, yeah, everybody well, goes process yeah and that's one of the things is like recentering the conversation um one of the things that's a valuable piece of having an open source project is that it allows you to scale up adoption early and then at some point you start to look at either conversion you can frame it in the in the in the context of conversion where i now have this large potential market that i can sell into or you frame it in terms of like the open source adoption is a channel that creates an opportunity for you to reach prospects through another channel, like the side door that you mentioned, Jeff, where, you know, um, AWS came in through the side door because people in, in uh, 
business departments were using their their corporate credit cards to pay for their AWS subscription, and it wasn't going through central IT. Um, yeah. That's how Linux got into companies, was people were using Linux to run the web server and the print server and the file server uh, that were running on the old PCs in the corner. And then all of a sudden, they realized, well, actually, hold on a second. We're now running business critical applications on it. We better figure out what's going to happen. Um, that's the that's the great part of having a bit of gray hair in our collective heads is that yeah. you know everything repeats itself. You know this whole model uh, came through when I was an early engineer working in the cellular industry back in the early '90s because you know no business in their right no CFO in their right mind was allowing you know any you know significant size business. Uh, to adopt uh, cellular phones because my God, that's a thousand dollar bill every month. But um, those those innovative salespeople found ways to bury the expense because it made them so much more productive on the road. Yeah. So let's talk about how open source affects channels, affects how you acquire customers, acquire users, how you differentiate between uh, community and customer. Um, how you think about that relationship of somebody evolving from a community user to a customer is that um, you know is that conversion or is that just somebody who's entered into your field of vision through one channel changing to another channel because of a change of use case or you know so, let, let, let me start with Stephen because I know you have strong opinions on this and then we'll we'll go back. So to we 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 jokingly started you know let, let's coin Mikos's law. Uh, there, there was a Martin Mikos presentation back in around 2006 time frame where you know MySQL was still a, a uh, you know standing company so was Jboss at the time and Mikos made the, the fabulous observation that you know your community has time and no money and your customers have money and no time and that, that, like I said, that needs to be called Mikos's law because he was the first time I ever heard that stated so crisply. And you know that imp implication was that you kind of have a bucket of people you're interacting with in a community and a bucket, that, but they don't have any money. Like you can't sell them anything. If you try and sell them something, you'll just piss them off. And then you also have customers who have a genuine problem that you have, you've parked a solution onto. But the other horrible thing he said at the time in that in that same talk was he stated the fact for every thousand copies of MySQL that's out, that are out there, I have one customer. And I think people people thought they heard a conversion ratio. He already laid down the basic law. You know, community has time and no money. You can't sell them something. But in that conversion ratio, almost instantly, JBoss kind of stood up and said, oh, one in 100 for us, because they thought it was a conversion ratio. And you know, Red Hat, not being left out of the discussion, said, oh, we convert about one in 10. You know, and when you look at business ratios in a, in a class of businesses, Nobody's ratios, you know, vary by orders of magnitude. You know, you're all up or, up or down one or two percent, and those are those are critical decisions and differences in the way businesses in that category operate. So it's not a conversion ratio in any kind of direct sense. Uh, Javier Saltero talked about his startup experience around open source, and he said they had basically a big shining button on their homepage that when you landed on the homepage for Hyperic, it basically said, oh, you're interested in open source, Please, you know, you're the open source community, go this way. And it, you clicked on the button and you vanished into their community engagement world because you don't want to lose track of those people. They are potentially future customers, but they have no money to buy anything from you. So trying to, trying to sell something is the wrong thing. You want to keep them happy on your technology base so they aren't using somebody else's. But then the whole rest of the Hyperic you know, experience on their homepage into their direct sales and all the rest of the pieces of the business was all about efficiently selling the Hyperic product line. And and so it's, it's that separation of understanding that these are two groups of people and big corporations, sure, there'll be somebody running a copy of Fedora in the back corner while somebody else is buying RHEL, but they aren't the same buyer, you know, just because they work for the same company. And so that's the thing is, is there's a nuance in there that you have to tease apart because otherwise you end up in these horrible places of thinking you have a conversion ratio and 
putting your, you know, all of your open source community energy in the marketing department because you think somehow it's going to pay off directly. And instead of actually organizing around those two camps of, of, of engagement. But I have had that conversation where I imagine you have <laughs> names, names changed to protect, protect the innocent. And um, where I was uh, talking to a product marketing manager who um, was asking, I was trying to convince them that rather than have an evaluation page where they would take all of the details and sign you up and get the, get you into their funnel for a, for the evaluation proof of concept. The funnel. Yes, that we would push uh, those people who wanted to try the project before they engaged with us commercially towards the community, community so that we could engage with them and have a conversation. And, and that we would get more people that way because the barrier of filling out the sign-up page was was causing them to lose a lot of people along the way. And he asked if there was any way that he could capture the details of, of when they entered our field of vision, because he could put a dollar value on everybody who signed up through that form. Because he knew X percent of the people who sign up through this form engage with the sales team later. Y percent of the people who engage with the sales team end up buying uh, a commercial proof of concept and, and Z percent end up uh, going to the going to production afterwards. So he knew each new sign up was worth seventeen dollars and forty three cents or whatever, um, and he wanted to be able to do the same thing. And I said that's not that would trying to do that in the open source community would be counterproductive. Um, you were ever so polite. We need to we need to figure out some other way of of creating a kind of a um, a metric that shows how in the globality, uh, if that's even a word. I, I like it. Please keep inventing. I like it. Uh, growing the community is good for growing our business. So it's a more of a, a correlation rather than causation. And um, I did not win that argument. So right. I'm curious, Jeff, do you, do you have a different opinion on this? Do you agree with us both on this or do you, uh, do you disagree? No, I think that your the the argument is sound. I think the interesting you know uh, mental exercise is to uh, uh, hypothesize what if you know cloud or you know infrastructure or software as a service didn't really come into play because a lot of these um, innovations in you know, licensing of software that was open source and now is still trying to claim to be open source but you know that's a question that's a whole another thread we can jump into but a lot of this questioning of the business model also seems to come from uh, uh, that that friction between um again vcs and startups that want to leverage the you know low friction, rapid adoption that you can obtain by putting your code out in open source versus then how do you, uh, you know, fully pivot and try and prevent uh, all of the, you know, work that um, the, that startup drove, because that's another interesting thing that's a difference between say Red Hat's long-term model and this more short-term model that we've seen for the last five or seven years where it's not really a community that's developing this code. It's a startup yeah. that's dominating the code development and wants to then move that all that hard work they put into their open source project into uh, a business model they feel that is secure and not likely to be hijacked by a cloud platform. Right. And as you pointed out earlier, you know, you want to be you want to maintain market leadership in any market that develops around that software. And as a result, you end up being a community of one and you're a market leader in a very small segment. Um, yeah, there's, there's, been, there's been statements from Thomas Curian that got reported in the press. You know, he's kind of hinting at, you know, we never should have given Kubernetes away as, as EVP for, you know, the cloud business at Google. But they gave Kubernetes away before he arrived, so it's not his fault. But he, you know, he needs to understand, and you, you can't hold it against him with his Oracle background. Kubernetes never would have become what it is if Google had held it tightly. It just mm -hmm. that that ecosystem would have been very tiny, relatively, yeah, <laughs> relatively speaking. <laughs>
At that, that no, time, that is so spot oh. on, Stephen. I, we can't agree more on that because today the cloud orchestration market segment pie chart would look dramatically different. Yeah, absolutely. You would have a big chunk of a Mesos community. You might even have a Docker Swarm slice of that pie. Uh, and then you'd no doubt have a well, narrow Kubernetes slice. As painful, as painful as it is to admit, service fabric was collateral damage. And, and you know, there's, Service Fabric was not a small investment by Microsoft to do a competitive thing. You know, in the same way that Google runs on Borg, Service Fabric was this thing that was an enormous engineering lift inside of the Azure cloud that we were trying to productize so that customers could take advantage of it. And that was kind of caught in the sideswipe. No, no, no Windows customer comes back to us and, and says, can I get me some you know, Service Fabric, please? So the, the execution of the original Kubernetes team was just brilliant yeah. in terms of the steps they took. And I, I, the thing I really like about the Kubernetes example is it was intentional and it's a, a model we can look at that is something that has happened not by happenstance and industry mistakes and you know big OEMs figuring it out. Linux has taken 30 years to dominate the way it is. But the that that first decade of its existence, there was a lot of happenstance in there. Right. You know, the, pre the predecessor to the Linux Foundation, when when we had the Open Source Development Lab, you know, it, it's the OEMs were probably horrified by the mistakes that happened when Linus was working for Transmeta. So when when Linus came free, you know, let, let let's hire Linus. What would we hire him into? Well, we'll hire him into the OSDL. You know, and and. You know, you need to protect these projects and protect the IP neutrality so that a, a real ecosystem can form. And you know that once you've got that protection around that that neutrality and the licensing's understood, big businesses can do big things. Well, it's also a cautionary tale in some respects, though, right? Because if you look at the hyperscalers, whether we want to call them Fang or come up with another handle. Um, they all have that consumption of open source in common, uh, but the way they're contributing back varies across a broad spectrum. Right. And well, I mean, you, I think, I think you touched on it awesome. earlier, this uh, issue of Google. Um, you know, Google's a great company. They've done great things for open source. But I've seen as well, Stephen, that sort of pivot back from, well, we, we love open source, but we also want to keep it close and yeah. um you know sometimes that can have some measure of success they would point to tensorflow and say look we never gave that away and you know that we were happy with that but true success in open source is when you've got that level playing field and absolutely open governance yeah, I would I would my comment on that is that the frame of contributing back is probably the wrong frame because it sounds like it's a, like corporate responsibility or social responsibility frame rather than what I call the enlightened self-interest frame. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was going to use that same term. It's self-interest frame is really what I intend by contributing back and um I need yeah. my changes in the core. <laughs> but 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 again, think about it, uh, you know, I'm not going to pick out any particular one, but every every major player today, and even second tier players, they're all looking at open source differently. They're trying. They're kind of grasping for where is this going from here, and some of the road signs are a bit of a cautionary tale. You know, curves ahead. But so it's time for you to start to take us home, Dave. So yeah, to finish up, I I, I do want to finish on um, something on that has come up uh, in this conversation, which I think is very interesting. And that is, you know, we've talked about um, open source is not necessarily all of your business model, but it's a key consideration in your business model. And one of the things that I think when you're starting to build a business model and design a business model around an open source project is some of the things we've talked about. How do you ensure that when somebody enters your sales funnel, that the salesperson is aware of whether they're already using the open source project in their company, right? Do you have an in? How do you make the connection between the user, the customer user as a, the community user as a 
a promoter for your sales, for example. Uh, and, and that's something that a lot of open source projects and I should say open source based companies don't necessarily do well. And it's a kind of a key consideration, I think, in, in open source business model design is what are you actually trying to accomplish with the open source project? We talked about Kubernetes as essentially being, we want to create some kind of de facto standard container orchestration layer. That's not a commercial revenue driven goal, but it enables revenue driven goals in the back end. Yeah, it's 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 a fabulous way to do complement space things that make your core product sticky, and then your core solutions sticky. Yeah, it's it's I think the the biggest challenge when I see a small company starting up is they're looking at it as I'm open sourcing my core value proposition, and I'm thinking you better really 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 understand how you're going to explain that to people. But if they do it in those those complement value add spaces around the core value, they can do enormous things to make their product sticky in that kind of network or portfolio of things. So it's, yeah, well, it's a very I, I different approach. Steve even agree with me that there actually is an open source business model. No, no, I'm pretty sure I didn't say that. <laughs> well, I, I will leave uh, one last thought um, as an interesting metaphor, right? Bring, it, it bring us home. Me, it occurred to me over the last, you know, couple of days as I mused about this and in some respects, it's like different positions of, you know, people on the Supreme Court. You know, are, are, are you an, an originalist? You know, Ooh, should open source wow. be just as it was defined, you know, by the founding fathers 20 years ago and cast, you know, in perpetuity in stone? And, or is it a living document? Should And I would argue that open source should be a living document that, <laughs> should evolve wow. and grow over time. I see what you did there. I see what you did. And it's very oh. well done and very painful to be on the receiving end of it. I, <laughs> Nothing, I, no, that I, was I, I doffed my was, hat, sir. That was at, done with your love closing and, argument. and affection. Well done. I, I do like that as a thought exercise. And, and I don't know if you followed, there's a new license that came out just today or yesterday from a, a machine learning ML.js project. <laughs> where they've essentially said, they've essentially made uh, availability of the s software contingent on respecting the project's code for conduct, which is a very interesting hack and one, one worth considering. I just, it's in the Another day. Living, uh, of living document, I thought it was an interesting assignment. Uh, so I'd like start us off on our second hour if you're not careful. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank you both for joining me today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Happy next, to be here. Yeah. And next week, I have um, Maintaining the Middle, How We Can Ensure Open Source is Long-Term Sustainable. I'll be joined by Pia Mancini. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It could be Mancini of Open Collective and Luis Villa of uh, Tidelift. We're going to talk about basically some of, the, some of the sustainability issues around software that doesn't have startups behind it and how we have become to, be, come to depend on these critical pieces of software and how we can ensure that they continue to be maintained in a sustainable manner. And I'm also happy to announce that I will be adding an episode 11 to season two. Uh, the week after that, I'll be, I'll be joined by Anil Lakani and Craig Kirsteens. Uh, Anil is a, a product marketing specialist in startup space. Craig is a serial entrepreneur. Who's, he's been a, a co-founder of Heroku and has worked on a number of um, Postgres uh, based startups, uh, Crunchy Data is his current his current company. I stand corrected, Dave. You do have a future in sales. You're doing quite well. Thank you, thank you. And uh, and we're going to talk about basically that inflection point in open source startups where you're going from founders who are technology focused to building a product marketing, sales, and product management functions, and kind of really figuring out how you're going to address uh, your potential market. Uh, so I think that's one of those key inflection points that that is really interesting and uh, often kind of happens by accident in startups. So I'm going to bring in experts who have kind of done this numerous times thoughtfully, and I'm I'm really excited to talk to them about it. So thank you again. Um, that is it for today. I know that uh, uh, you both have things to get to. I'd like to thank you again for joining me. And this will be up on YouTube later this evening or tomorrow. Excellent. Always a pressure. I, a pleasure, Dave and Stephen. Take care, folks. Thanks, thanks. for the thanks for the time again. Bye bye now. <laughs>